seems recording. Okay, nice to see everyone. Uh, we've got these two papers. We're doing a Mediterranean session today, which I think is the first time we've done a proper Mediterranean session. This is yeah. uh, this is our thirty seventh session, not including the two we did for uh, World Seabird Conference. But uh, yeah, we've been we've doing this for a while now, and I'm really stoked that we're uh, branching out now and getting into some some areas of the world that we haven't really touched on before. So. Um, I think if I'm right, our first paper that we're discussing today is sexual segregation in the foraging behavior of a slightly dimorphic seabird. This is Jose Manuel Reyes Gonzalez, who is with us today. Um, I believe I saw, oh yes, there he is. Hello, Jose, how are you? Nice to see you. Um, we'll unmute you in just a few minutes. And I think, Mariana, this is your paper. So I yes. will hand it over to you, my friend. <laughs> yeah. I also wanted to say that we have been planning this, uh, uh, this session, the Mediterranean session, since, uh, since a while. So Jose, when you came here to Chizé, we already knew that we wanted to, uh, to have you on the session. And I just was it just, just very quiet. And said, I'll come to you and I'll hunt you down. <laughs> so yes, finally. Anyway, uh, with this paper in uh, Journal of Animal Ecology, uh, we actually get to the Northwest uh, Mediterranean and uh, we talk about uh, uh, scopoli uh, shearwaters and the sexual segregation. So sexual segregation in foraging strategies can work as a mechanism to endure or even avoid the competition between male and females. And in species with uh, sexual size dimorphism, the dominant sex, which is usually the, the larger one, gains priority to access the, uh, the foraging uh, resources, um, especially when they are limited. Sexual size dimorphism can also uh, imply differences in uh, species structure associated with the prey handling. Uh, for example, we can have differences in, in, the, bill, in the bill on, of the birds, and uh, it can allow basically each sex to exploit a different type of prey due to the variation in the foraging ability. And basically this means that we can also have uh, uh, variation and segregation in the uh, trophic niche uh, with, uh, with our these then uh, research uh, partitioning. So considering the species with the sexual uh, dimorphism, the authors basically consider several scenarios where competition between the sexes might increase. So we have the first scenario where uh, during the breeding season, uh, for example, colonial breeders engage in intense foraging on the feeding grounds around the colony, which is basically causing this uh, local depletion of uh, foraging resources, which is called the Ashmole hollow. And this might actually increase the intersexual competition. As a second scenario, we have unfavorable env environmental condition, which is leading to uh, uh, prey uh, scarcity, scarcity, um, scarcity, scarcity, sorry. <laughs> um, and then uh, competition, uh, so might be intensified um, in the subordinate sex, so the smaller, uh, the smaller sex in, uh, in this case, which will be outcompeted um, and basically will pay a higher cost in increasing foraging, uh, foraging effort. And then basically we have sexual competition in regions that are characterized by intense fishing pressures. So when fishery, uh, fishery activities usually increase, and so we have an increase in the discards uh, and more abundant uh, discards, so basically the competition might decrease. But when the discards, we are in a condition of a discard uh, shortage, then the competition might increase, so which means that the dominant sex might have the priority, basically, on these um, um, man-made uh, fishing, uh, fishing ground. So the authors aim to assess sexual differences in the foraging strategies of a seabird species with the slight sexual size dimorphism, the scopoli shearwater, and to evaluate whether contrasting interannual environmental conditions and fishing fleet activities may play a role in shaping such differences. So they are using four years of uh, tracking data, GPS uh, tracking data, stable uh, isotope analysis, environmental data, and fisheries tracking data the, um, obtained from the VMS uh, system and investigate basically the sexual uh, uh, segregation in scopoli shearwater foraging behavior. 
So um, females, basically, um, which are slightly smaller than males, uh, were actually outcompeted by uh, by males, and so um, it was uh, um, uh, could be outcompeted by males. And the authors hypothesized actually that the females, which actually happened then in the end, uh, females show greater foraging efforts than male, and the both males and females would increase foraging effort in case of unfavorable environmental condition and uh, lower fishing attendance of females. Um, um, as a competitive uh, uh, exclusion, basically, of females by males should actually, actually limit um, the access to the, to the resources. So there was actually found a consistent uh, difference in space, uh, in space use and the resource uh, and resource use in, uh, in all these, uh, basically, uh, hypotheses. Um, and uh, so um, I actually have a question, um, Jose. So would you, um, I was curious about the position basically of the, uh, of the colony, of the Scopoli she water. Um, so would you, because I am really, I do not know about this species. Could you tell me like if there are other colonies um, that uh, all are also exposed to, to more or less uh, fishing, uh, fishing pressure? Hi, first of all, uh, and apologize because I think my internet connection is not so good here at home. So maybe you. We hear you fine. Hear me by cut. So fine, okay, because I'm hearing you constantly cutting the message. So it's my internet uh, connection. So I don't know if I catch uh, right your question, but uh, <laughs> okay. And she said. Uh, there, there are more uh, colonies in the in the area. So these colonies in the in the north part of Menorca, which is the east uh, eastern uh, the most east uh, island of uh, Balearic Islands. But all the all the north part of this of this Menorca island is uh, have uh, many uh, scopoli water colonies. But we we work in the in the most important. In fact, this is the most important in all the Balearic island uh, archipelago. But uh, so no, when you looked uh, it's, at it's uh, when you looked uh, at uh, at the VMS data. Of the VMS data, yeah. Yeah. Um, did you have uh, an hotspot nearby the colony or it was all over the vms data were all over like also <clears> nearby <throat> other colonies well regarding the vms data uh, um we could say that there, there are like two main uh hotspots of, of fishing activity that are in in the in the surroundings of balearic island and especially in the in the Minorca channel that this is the the main water channel between Minorca and Mallorca and then other big hot spot in the in the Catalan waters but I wouldn't say that VMS data is uh, really representative of the waters very close to the colony because uh, probably in this area there are more uh, like more uh, little uh, fishing vessels operating and these vessels have, have, have no uh, VMS system but but we know that for example very close to the colony there, there are more like more mortality of scopolish waters because uh, other uh, <coughs> of our colleagues of the um, colleagues of the of the team publish another work and there are uh, high numbers of 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 birds uh, killed by um, long liners there but these are probably more artisanal fishing boats. Yeah, you you actually got uh, into my uh, next uh, next question, which was uh, like if you also have uh, information <laughs> about uh, the small uh, the small vessels uh, around uh, around the colony. Uh... Not at, the, not at this moment. I think, uh, I mean, the, the, the group of Jacob is still uh, continue this work. And now 
they are using GPS uh, on say, say, artisanal vessels because they are collaborating with some fishermen. And then we can get this kind of data, but I'm, I'm not, Jacob is here, I think, maybe he can say more about this, but I'm not really, uh, I don't really know how is this uh, issue now yeah. in the group. <clears throat> Well, yeah, I can I can add uh, something of this. I mean, I would say that uh, all VMS, the VMS, uh, the VMS system is covering all all boats uh, with a length over twelve meters. This includes basically all trawlers of the area uh, in the two major areas that uh, Jose pointed out that are within the foraging range of this colony. That it's one, it's the Menorca Channel, and the other one, it's in front of these islands. It's the, the Catalan coast, about 100, 150 kilometers uh, west of this island. So, um, and basically the association uh, between uh, Cori between Scopolisher waters and, and, and fishing vessels is, is based on, on trawlers. So they are mainly feeding on, on trawlers because it's, it's the fishery that is actually providing lots of uh, these cards. Um, there are also some artisanal fisheries that are not so well covered by the VMS system that are not really that important in terms of feeding uh, the birds somehow or providing uh, lots of food that it's the, the, the long liners that are a smaller scale and are not, not so well covered by the, by the VMS system. But uh, actually the, the importance of this, of this fleet, it's not, it's not for the quantity of, of uh, discards that they are providing because they are providing actually very few discards. Uh, the importance of this fleet, it's actually because it's the, the main source of mortality for the birds. So somehow the, this is not so well covered, but actually for the, in, in related to this war that is more focused on on, on, uh, on, on the importance of the discards, it's uh, actually working on the VMS data that it's actually very well represented in terms of the trawler uh, fleet. And uh, certainly we are now also trying to, to increase this, uh, this data set by providing GPSs to the artisanal uh, boats so that we can have at least some part of the, of the fleet, of the artisanal fleet also tracked. So we are providing uh, GPSs and uh, treating directly with fishermen and so on, perhaps covering maybe something like ten percent of this of this of this fleet. But that, but that's that wouldn't be that related to the to the to the discards. It's more related to the to the sources of mortality. Yeah, actually, this also gets to my to my next question, which was uh, so with the. Um, um, Given that the males uh, um, use the discards uh, uh, more than the females, uh, you expect the mortality um, in that, like a higher mortality in males uh, around the, 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 the fishing vessels. But then you were also saying that, uh, so by given that the female has to work more, then the female by running out basically a little bit more also like using the more, more energy, it might be that also you might have higher mortality in, in females. In Did you females. get my question? Yeah. Can you respond? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, I don't mind. I, I didn't catch well the, the question because it cut the... Okay, I, I, perhaps I can then respond. So, no, the, the, the higher mortality is in, is in males. The thing is that, um, well, we actually have shown in another, in another previous work that uh, the, the thing is that Scopolisher waters are mainly attending to trawlers because it's actually the fleet that is providing lots of discards. But what happens is that during, uh, particularly during the weekends, when this trawler... Uh, Boats are not working, and but the longliners do work during the during the during these uh, periods. Um, then the birds are just looking for alternative sources of food, and then it's when they actually attend the longliners and then they get caught. So what it um, what it actually happens is that uh, males mainly associate to, to trawlers, and when there are no trawlers, to longliners. And that's why males are suffering uh, 
more mortality because they actually kind of uh, are the dominant uh, sex in this context and kind of displacing a bit the females. And this ends up with an increase in mortality, particularly when the troller fleet is not working. Um, David Aaron Grant, if you have also other questions or the audience. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for the the, uh, the very uh, um, neat uh, paper and analysis. Um, obviously, uh, a, a lot of work has flown in, into this, um, and and uh, I I found it interesting that uh, you you use the uh, NAO uh, index. Um, in a Mediterranean context, um, um, actually, it was the, f the first time I was reading about it. Maybe I, I should have paid more attention to um, to former papers. But I was I was wondering um, for for this area, uh, how did you come up with the NAO? Um, is is it something which was already uh, well established? Uh, did you try other indices? Um, and, and were there also beyond the NAO index uh, other proxies showing that some years were uh, better than, than others in, in terms of uh, food availability? Uh, so I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm quite curious about that aspect. Thanks for, for your words, David. Um, yeah, this was a, a, a nice point in this paper that I, I, I like to work with. So I, I, we, we already know that uh, this uh, now has worked for the uh, group of species, not silvers, but other groups, and, and that uh, could be a good, uh, a good index for integrating what is happening in the Northwest Mediterranean because it's related also with um, probably in an indirect way, but it's, it's influencing the, the amount of water that rivers uh, bring to the, to the sea and the process uh, in the upwellings and so on. So we also tried another, not, not like other integrated index, but other environmental information like uh, the typical ones, not chlorophyll A and sea surface temperature and sea surface gradient and um, I don't remember, but more three they are in the supplementary material in the back of the paper, but all of them were more or less uh, correlated. And, and finally, because of parsimony, we, we, we prefer to focus only on this in this uh, index because it's probably the one that you that, that capture all the variability, the abnormal variability, and the, the one that probably you. If we think in in a, in a longest time series, for example, repeating this this. The study ten, uh, in, in, in ten years is probably the, the, the one index that, that you can take and, and easily integrate in, in a model without the all the variability that other environmental features can can have can has, for example. <clears throat> okay. Th yeah. Thanks a lot. No, please um, reply to your question. Yes, surely. Th uh, thanks a lot. Um, I have a, another small question, but maybe Grant wants to. Uh, I, to might, uh, <clears throat> I might just see if anybody in the audience has a question first. Um, and if they do, please feel free to wave frantically. Oh, yeah, Florian, please go yes. ahead. Hello, Jose. Uh, thank you very much for, for this paper. I really uh, enjoy it. And uh, I was just curious if you, on the feed, have you ever seen uh, some. Uh, direct competition between male and female, like aggressive behavior or behind the fisheries. Uh, yeah, do you understand me? Yeah, 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 I got to your question. Uh, okay. We didn't see, or at least I didn't see this when I was on board in some uh, vessels, but uh, I know other, other work, other work that we cite in the paper that is, uh, has been done by, uh, I think, I. Maybe Hakopo is, is a quote, I don't remember, but it's, it's a, a, a paper uh, by Marco Cianzetti Benedetti, I think is the, the surname. Uh, and they use an accelerometer and they clearly found in the accelerometer data that, that um, like, like the, the, well, the, 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 the females are in this, in this disadvantage. No? They, 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 they spend more energy uh, uh, behind a vessel trying to catch uh, these cards than the, the males and, and they, they were able to find this in, in the in the data 
So despite we don't see this, because at sea it's really hard to, to distinguish between males and females in this species, but at least with other biologic data uh, between many groups, we are the different this issue. May I, may I add something about this? Um, I mean, that one interesting question that uh, for sure all you have already discussed at some point, it's uh, the, the importance of competence in the, in the distribution uh, of, of the different species, populations and sexes in, in seabirds. Because at sea, I'm talking about the, the competence at sea, because in the end, um, sometimes it's hard to imagine, and, and I know some, some very well-known seabird ecologists don't believe actually that there is actual competence of seabirds at sea. It's very hard to, to really uh, demonstrate this. And there are some evidences that it may happen in uh, close to the to the colonies, but then we are talking about colonies of tens of thousands, of hundreds of thousands of pairs living exactly in the same place, and on a species that are uh, foraging in immediately close to the colony, not on brassellary forms, that they can travel more than one thousand kilometers from 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 the place they breed to look for food. So it's hard to imagine that they are competing. Uh, at sea for, for the resources, at least, and, and I, I generally, I, 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 that's my view, and perhaps some people here can, can discuss this, because it's always a hot discussion, whether the competence is actually somehow driving this, this, this segregation among populations, or among sexes, or among ages, or, and so on. But uh, in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this context, this context is a bit different because uh, this is more close to actually um, the world we did uh, perhaps uh, 20 years ago on, on giant pets. Uh, it's more similar to this because the, the, the competence is not a, it's, it's, it's an interference competence. So birds are actually somehow competing in concentrating in a specific resource. In the case of the giant petals are carcasses, in the case of the, the scopolisher waters are vessels. So they, they really meet and concentrate behind the vessel. And I think in this case, it's for me, it is much clearer that they can actually compete uh, for these resource because they are actually there at the same time in the same place, uh, trying to catch the food. So in this sense, I, I, I believe that in this context, competence can make a role. Yeah, uh, very interesting. Uh, thank you for the for the answers. And do you think if you have the, the age of the bird, you, you can uh, maybe see some differences between maybe old females that uh, learn uh, that they, they have to avoid to be in competition with the male. So maybe uh, when you have competition, you have maybe younger individuals that have to learn that at first. So maybe like a time time effect in uh, in this sexual segregation. Thank you. I, I don't know if Jacob would want to say something. I can say something in this regard. Uh, I think we, we, have, we cannot uh, know the, the age of the birds, at least a big part of the birds, at least at this moment, maybe in 20 years uh, we, can, we could, but no, no. Uh, and uh, I would say that the, old, the older the bird, I would expect the less attendance to vessels. Because other other work published in 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 Cori Water that is really very close to this one, uh, they found uh, this was uh, I think uh, published by Katri and, and his team. Uh, they found that the, the older the bird, uh, like like less less <laughs> less uh, how I say this in English uh, less proper to to work. I mean uh, mass. Um, <laughs> so, uh, sorry that I, I did not catch completely the question. Uh, do you, did you ask whether there are differences in, or do you expect difference in age classes behind the troller, uh, behind the fishes, the yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we have some indirect evidences about this based on mortality. So, 
Um, the thing is that uh, we, we have been exploring the age of the birds that have been caught by longliners in the Mediterranean, the Western Mediterranean, in the Spanish fleet of longliners. And um, this is uh, published in a, in a MEPS paper that uh, some years ago by, by, by Vero Cortez and, and, and uh, collaborators that uh, it was part of her PhD. And uh, what we, what actually what we could see is that the mortality mainly takes place during the during the breeding season, when uh, when when birds are actually trying to trying to to forage for food, uh, possibly in, in a, um, they have higher um, somehow higher um, uh, energy requirements because they have to feed the, the they have to incubate and fast and then they have to feed the, the chicks and so on. So somehow at this period they tend to associate more to, to trawlers and to fish to fishing boats uh, than in other periods. And it's actually when, when mortality peaks take place during the breeding periods. And, and, um, and when we look at the, at the age of the birds, actually during this period, adult breeding birds are an important proportion of this mortality. And we should expect the other way around because uh, if we if we talk about the general proportion of, of immatures in the in the population, uh, we would expect higher numbers in, in of immatures um, than than or at least fifty percent of the mortality would be immatures if 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 the mortality would be by chance, and it, and then it shouldn't be so marked to the to the to the specific breeding periods of the adult bird. So somehow mortality is biased. To, to towards breeders, which is not good news of of course for the impact of the fisheries, and um, and it's particularly acute during the periods when breeders are actually seeking for food. And for me, it makes sense because uh, it's when actually they have a higher demand and birds are kind of more prone to take higher risk for food. So they are associating to sources that maybe if they are not really hungry or pressured to get food, they wouldn't associate so much. Can, can, Thank you, can I add something? Oh yeah, please do, Jose. Because I, I was trying to say something related to the Florian Oliver uh, uh, question. I mean, a part of this that uh, Jacob is saying, if, if we think in, in all birds and, and for breeding birds, I think the older the, the bird, probably uh, more lazy, according to papers of uh, Catri, for example, Paulo Catri. And then I would ex expect that the, the oldest birds uh, would attend less to vessels, but it's just my expectation. We, we don't have enough data to, to know about this. Yeah, that, that echoes uh, recent studies, uh, for instance, in, uh, in albatrosses, uh, where there's, uh, there's indications that older birds, um, well, attend fishery vessels less or get excluded in some ways. So that, that seems to be coherent with these results. Lovely. Okay, I think we're, we're coming close to time here. I just wanted to, to thank Jose and Jacob for joining us. I think Fernanda was actually in for a few minutes. It looked like she was sort of traveling somewhere or something and she uh, popped in and out and then uh, and this disappeared presumably because she lost connection. But uh, I just wanted to acknowledge her um, contribution to this paper as well. And, uh, and thank you both for joining us. Now, while we're here, before we move into the next question, uh, next uh, paper, I just wanted to throw this out to you guys to ponder a little bit. Maybe you can chat about it in the in the chat if you'd like. Um, and that's about the, the conservation um, aspects of this sort of work. I mean, we see this all the time, right? There's loads of papers out there now that show that there are uh, differences in, in how the sexes use, um, use space. And so the question is, is how, how do you how do you approach that from a conservation perspective? Do you take the precautionary principle and just apply conservation rules to the entire species, or do you do it? Do you have separate rules for separate sexes and separate regions? And how the, how do you apply that practically? And and if anyone has any perspectives on that, please do share it in the chat because I I'd, I'd certainly personally be interested to to hear your thoughts on that. Um, now, with that, I think we can move on to the next paper, and we've got Federico de Pascalas, who's joined us, and Jacopo. Um, and um, yeah, we'll unmute you or ask you to unmute in a few minutes. And David, I think this is your paper. Yes, um, welcome, and uh, and so nice to uh, to see so many uh, friendly faces uh, tonight. 
And, uh, and as you notice, this is the first uh, Mediterranean session uh, because as Mariana uh, very nicely recapped on, on seabird sessions, at the end of the spring, at once we realized uh, we cover most of the world's oceans, but we don't have a Mediterranean. Shame, shame on us. Um, so we're, we're very happy for this session. And, uh, and also this is a call, uh, if you're aware of, of papers uh, from the southern shore of the Mediterranean, uh, we would be uh, very happy to, uh, to welcome them uh, in, in future uh, sessions. So, Amici. In this first Mediterranean seabird session, we are delighted to present a study led by Federico De Pascalis from uh, Università di Milano and uh, Jacopo Cecere from uh, ISPRA near Bologna and uh, several other co-authors from uh, several institutions in Italy. Um, I, I found their paper really exciting and probably I'm not the only one um, because they track the foraging movements of uh, Europe's smallest seabird, the fascinating storm petrel. This species weighs less than, uh, a little less than 30 grams, uh, yet it's extremely long lived with some individuals reaching 30 years. Storm petrels dance on ocean waves to gather plankton, and they also ride the dreams of many marine ornithologists because they are these elusive creatures you only briefly encounter at sea or in the dark on seabird islands. Until recently, very little was known about their foraging uh, ecology and migration. But for the last 10 years, it was clear to all of us that sooner or later, people would manage to uh, attach tracking devices to them. Uh, this happened in no less than three studies released uh, during the last year, one by uh, Mark Bolton, who tracked storm petrels in Shetland, a second by uh, Rodger and colleagues uh, who tracked birds at the Benidorm colony in Spain, and the study we discussed today, uh, during which uh, Federico and his friends uh, GPS tracked storm petrels from a colony on the west coast of uh, Sardinia. Uh, the authors worked uh, both during the incubation and chick rearing phases, and they showed that the birds mainly forage in a diagonal uh, between the west coast of Sardinia and the south coast of France, um, somewhere on the Riviera, uh, close to sunny uh, Saint-Tropez. Uh, so you, you have to imagine that diagonal bend, uh, but it's not inclusive, exclusive. So uh, it's a range of about 300 kilometers. And uh, some individuals also ventured towards the Balearic Islands and the coast of uh, Tuscany. All across their study, um, I found that the authors were extremely thorough with uh, respect to the methods they, they used. Uh, this concerns the devices they, they chose, uh, which weighed less than one gram, and uh, also the detailed impact study they, they performed to ensure that the tracking method uh, did not affect bird fitness and, and bias their results. And I also found their spatial analysis uh, really neat. Ov overall, the, the paper flowed really nicely. Uh, it, was, uh, it was really a, a pleasure to, to read and, uh, and nicely illustrated. Uh, for the analysis they performed, they, they tested uh, linkages between storm petrol movements and uh, oceanographic features uh, with a particular interest for uh, sub-mesoscale eddies. They found that storm petrels forage in areas uh, characterized by water mixing and steering uh, where the combined effect of strong currents and uh, limited depth increase vertical water mixing. Uh, this all creates area of elevated subsurface primary productivity or, or potentially brings zooplankton near the, the sea surface. Yet they also showed that these associations uh, between ocean physics and storm petrol foraging behavior varied strongly uh, between breeding phases and years, uh, indicating complex uh, flexible foraging patterns. Larger sample sizes, especially during incubation, will probably help fulfill this, uh, this picture. And of course, we are very keen on uh, potential results from GLS tracking uh, studies during migration. Uh, notably to infer how many of these birds will uh, leave the Mediterranean or just uh, maybe fly towards Tunisia and uh, spend the, the winter there, as uh, most sensible people should do. Um, but there, of course, they could get the risk, uh, they could run the risk of getting into a, a major seabird bycatch hotspot. Who knows? Federico, Jacopo, and friends, uh, many thanks for this uh, study. 
uh, which made me dream of small yet uh, magnificent seabirds riding the ocean surface. And uh, as I said, your, your paper was, was really a, a pleasure to, uh, to read. Um, my first question is quite simple. Um, looking at these results, and I think you, you also, like me, you must have dreamed about tracking these birds for a long time. Was there a surprise? Was there no surprise with the results? Uh, what was the most surprising fact uh, about what you found? Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for inviting us. It's uh, very exciting to be here. And thank you, David, for your words. I think you managed to describe uh, storm petrels perfectly and to explain uh, why we find them so fascinating. And uh, so, yes, we, it, it, was like, uh, it was like a dream that finally came true to track them and to see what they actually are doing and how they find food because uh, when you see them in the sea, when you observe them, they just fly very quickly nearby or they forage walking on the water and you can't help wonder how they manage such small birds uh, to find uh, the food in, in, uh, in the open sea. So I think for me, the um, most uh, unexpected finding was that considering that we were working on small sample sizes, the patterns we observed uh, were quite clear. So the pattern uh, observed uh, with the dynamic features, so currents, eddies, and filaments were, were linear and clear. And, uh, and that uh, was surprising because generally when, uh, when I play around with environmental features, the, it's not that straightforward, especially if you're working with small sample sizes. So that was, uh, that was very exciting and also see um, the interaction between a static and a dynamic feature such the, as the bathymetry and the current speed that uh, it was uh, for me very, very interesting. Also because it was confirming what uh, you can see from boats. You can see that storm petrol often forage close to sea mounts. And uh, so it was, uh, I think, kind of interesting to be able to observe this from the GPS data. Yeah, yeah I, can, I can really imagine you in the field downloading the data and then trying <laughs> to see on the screen saying, come on, come on, come on. And then, and then at once uh, you, you see, um, you see the, the, the track. Uh, of course, yeah. there's a big discussion, you know, to... Um, uh, we won't have time to, to address uh, all, all the points, but uh, to me, one of the key points is that many people have been trying to link the Cibre tracks to um, sub-mesoscale uh, Lagrangian uh, features. And, and in many studies, um, it didn't work, or you had the feeling uh, that some of the authors, um, well, I think Stephen Jay Gould were, was, uh, was describing this as, you know, people forcing the fact into theory. I want my tracks to, uh, to fit with, um, with these um, mesoscale features. And I, I, that's why I found also in your study that it was working well. And, and that was quite, uh, that was quite a, a, a surprise to me. Uh, so I, I don't want I, I don't know whether you you have any comments about 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 that. Yeah, I, I was surprised too because uh, I actually tried uh, the same uh, variable with the scopoly shear water and nothing came out. So I was like, no way, it's working. And then I, you, I was really excited to see this pattern. And um, on just to reply to your first comment. Uh, the first uh, ever track we observed, uh, me and Jacopo were very excited. We couldn't uh, sleep. So we were in, uh, we were, I think we've been working for like 30 hours or more without sleeping, but uh, we had to download the first track of the Storm Petrol and it was very exciting. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Actually, Federico, you can tell the story that uh, we tried to, to, to sleep during, during the day, yeah. you know? No, and, I... and then Federico woke up to go to the toilet and, uh, and he woke up, woke up me and I said, come on, Federico, now you are not in the bed now. Uh, let's go to, to see our tracks, no? Because what I think is that uh, uh, probably the unexpected achievement that we obtained for this study is that we managed to obtain some tracks <laughs> because at the beginning, 
we were not because we work in a, in a colony uh, with not nice boxes you know uh, it's really hard to work in our colony because it's a it's a cave then i can show you a picture if i can um share the, the screen but in any case it, it's a cave with a lot of chambers and uh, many birds breeding in the same chamber so when you go when you target for, for a bird you disturb all the other birds so it's really, really hard to work there without um, without have uh, some uh, inconvenience, you know. There, but we managed to to obtain to retrap these birds, and they they continue they, their breeding duties, and we were very happy on on this. Yeah, and we didn't yeah. disturb yeah, the sorry. whole colony. <laughs> yeah, I've sure. I've enabled screen sharing. Jacopo, if you want to do, if you want to screen share, you should be able to. And yeah, and, and in the meantime, um, I, I must say that uh, yeah, I found uh, a really interesting paradox that we have these uh, these um, oceanic, highly oceanic seabed, and at the same time, you know, the response to uh, bathymetry is so strong, and uh, and and in in some cases with the tracking, you you showed that they were fairly uh, coastal. So, um, so I found I found I found that really interesting. I I wondered whether this was known from at sea surveys in in the area, or whether people could see birds sometimes from the shore. So no, uh, not in our study area because uh, uh, almost nothing was known about the at sea distribution of storm petrels in Italy. So when you talk with uh, some fishermen, they can tell you that uh, sometimes they see them foraging or flying, but uh, nothing was known about it. I found uh, in the literature some suggestion in all the old studies in the, um, around the UK, where uh, they observed uh, uh, storm petrel, especially um, around sea mounts or uh, around uh, mm, uh, places where the bathymetry, where the waters were shallow. And um, there is a neat paper that uh, shows that uh, there is also in, uh, of course, uh, in the UK, an interaction with the tide that, uh, of course, we don't have in the Mediterranean. So I think uh, what we observed confirmed that uh, they actually have a strong link with bathymetry. So not only with dynamic features, but uh, it's, it's a it's a finely modulated interplay that uh, I'm not sure I got uh, entirely, but uh, for sure I will keep looking into it because I find it uh, really interesting. Mm, yeah. Well, I have several other questions, but um, I'll, I'll open the floor to um, Mariana Grant, everyone. Yeah, no worries. And I think I'll pass it over to Mariana, but I want to make this comment first. The storm petrels are by far like that's. That group of birds is, is what got me into seabirds. I started my undergrad working with leeches storm petrels a long, long time ago. And it's the, it's, I got them tattooed on my shoulder. I love them so much. And I, I'm not a tattoo person, but that was, uh, that was a necessity. So I, I thought I'd, uh, I'd say thank you for this because I've been, I've been dying to see a, a, a storm petrel tracking paper for a very, very long time. Uh, Mariana, please. Yes. I, I am super excited as well because uh, I also helped uh, uh, monitoring storm petrels when I was doing my PhD in Scotland. And uh, I can really never forget uh, the nights spent uh, like running back and forth uh, to, to the nets and uh, getting these, these teeny tiny um, seabirds and they smell so good. It's not even a smell. <laughs> smell is not the right word. And uh, like everybody was telling me, you need to smell your hands. And uh, I had no idea what I was getting into. <laughs> and it was amazing. It was amazing. I had a pair uh, of gloves. I had a pair of gloves that smelled like storm petrels for years. Hey! And I couldn't help it. <laughs> I know, I know. It's amazing. It's really amazing. But so, yeah, my, I have a question. I have two questions. But my first question is actually uh, related to, uh, to the colony. I wanted to know, so thanks for the picture, uh, uh, Jacopo, uh, because I wanted to know um, for like how long uh, you have been monitoring uh, these, uh, uh, this colony and what do you know about it? Yeah, so that's uh, why probably Jacopo before said that, that uh, the most uh, unexpected result was to actually obtain some tracks, 
because what we did was uh, almost a jump in the dark. So uh, we knew there was a colony, but uh, we had uh, no idea of what was the situation in the colony. So there were some ringing activities that stopped uh, in the early 2000. And then uh, uh, we, we, we didn't know. So um, when we first uh, got there, uh, we were actually not sure about what we were going to find. And then it was uh, amazing because uh, you access the cave from the sea, then you jump uh, on the rocks, then you have to climb, and then you have to crawl into some holes. And then uh, you reach this chamber with the sand on the floor and hundreds of storm petrol perched there that are just looking at you. And uh, like a, it feels like being in a cathedral. It's an amazing place. So, um, so you start... know that now we are all going to come with you. I mean, and... <laughs> of course. <laughs> when, when you are in Italy, you're invited. Uh, I, I, I'll fly yeah. tomorrow and uh, <laughs> I can even drive. I can drive now to Italy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we, we, we actually restarted the monitoring uh, in uh, 2019 when the first year we started the study there. So it's been now three years uh, and we plan to keep going there every year to do at least uh, we are, we have like, uh, we establish some plots and we control productivity and fledging success every year. And uh, it would be uh, very interesting to use it as a long-term uh, like uh, monitoring uh, site. Very good, very good. So yeah, my second uh, question, unless uh, Grant, stop me if uh, someone is asking questions because I see the chat going and I, I, can, I can do two things at the same time. <laughs> we're, we're, we're just talking about storm petrol puke and seabird smell, so I wouldn't worry too much. <laughs> yeah. I also have stories of puking, uh, so of course. Uh, we, 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 do, we do have a legitimate question from Adrian in the, in the chat, which we'll, go, go, we go. can get to in a minute. Oh, no, no, go, do you, go. Okay, okay. No, so, so Adrian asks, why do you think the statistical relationships with dynamic oceanographic features are more obvious for storm petrels than for large bodied prosolarids? Yeah, so um, it's not that uh, I think they are more obvious, but uh, I think that considering their functional traits and their ecology, uh, there is a, like a tighter link with such features. Because uh, first of all, they are extremely small. So basically you can't get a smaller, much smaller than this. I think there is only one storm petrel species smaller than the European storm petrel. So you're like uh, on the edge of what is feasible for, for a seabird. Then they've got uh, a very um, developed sense of smell that uh, they probably use to find prey. So they probably use to track uh, DMS on the sea surface. And then uh, they, they eat plankton. And uh, since the dynamic oceanographic feature we study basically are uh, um, aggregate planktonic organism, then it, it, it's, uh, I would expect uh, a storm petrel to be more attracted because of those traits to, to a filament than for example, of a sheer water that can forage in other, uh, in other ways. So uh, that's, why um, I, I think uh, they, they are more linked to such features. And uh, also because uh, th their main prey is the plankton doesn't have uh, like, a, 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 they're not like fish. So their movements it, it is heavily influenced by currents and, and by what happens in the water column. So of course uh, they must have a stronger link with uh, what happened in the three-dimensional water column. Mm -hmm. We got uh, also another question uh, for you is about your hidden macro model. So Jose is asking uh, if you have considered also resting uh, behavior in your, uh, I mean, you have run a two states hidden macro model. Have you tried with, uh, with three states where you could have been resting yeah. or, yeah. Yeah, so I tried with the uh, three states, but uh, in the end it wasn't performing very well. Also because uh, we had to use uh, um, one hour fixes and then the, like the sampling resolution was too coarse for using a free state in the Markov model. Uh, actually we had uh, in 2019, we had uh, one fix uh, every 20 minutes, 
but uh, then we had a lot of issues with the devices and uh, I had to re, uh, resample those track at one hour's intervals. So that's yeah. why we use uh, two stated the Marco models. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, let me add that the, the devices now are really improved, you know? So we don't have any more gaps, large gaps, and we, we are now tracking uh, stormies with, uh, uh, I don't know, 10 minutes positions uh, with good resolution and no uh, gaps. So maybe in the future, we will manage to mm -hmm. also assess the resting behavior. I hope, at least I hope so. Yeah, I the hope device. So. Yeah, the devices no, uh, have improved uh, a lot in, in those three years and like uh, in the past uh, uh, field season. So two months ago, we managed to have uh, tracks with the one fix every 10 minutes. So in the future, we will do some uh, more like accurate models. And also soon with an accelerometer? Yeah, that, so <laughs> that would be uh, very neat and we are thinking about, uh, about it because uh, I think their energetics, uh, it's incredible. So, I mean, they, they, they for sure are extremely interesting to study from an energetical point of view. So that, uh, that would be amazing. You, you, see my eyes, you see my eyes sparkling there. <laughs> Obviously, at the moment, there is no chance to have both accelerometer and, no. and GPS on, on the same bird. But, uh, I know that your question is, uh, uh, which is the, the next step? And, uh, and the next step is to work on uh, uh, the relationship with the wind, no? So we expect that these birds are really uh, special in exploiting uh, uh, with conditions. And it's something that we would like to uh, investigate also with the use of a silver meter. Yeah, you give a hint. You give a hint in the discussion about that, uh, and and also at some stage uh, you mentioned dynamic soaring. Um, uh, does anyone have an idea of a proportion of dynamic soaring they they're using? No, no. So no, we don't have uh, an idea. That would be another another thing to investigate with uh, with the accelerometer if uh, we manage to to do the study. But uh, yes, as Jacopo. Idea. Yeah, my idea, which is based on uh, on nothing, is that they uh, they use the the wind to exploit areas, and then they can use maybe dynamic soaring to come back to to the colony. So I think that they are so light that they can use the, the wind, and they use the wind to explore areas that maybe they they don't control at all maybe not completely you know where to uh... I, I i will remember the expression a prior based on nothing so that's uh, that's neo bayesian yeah but uh, yeah more, yeah more, more seriously uh but yeah, may, maybe Federico, you want to add something, but, but the last small question I have is the relationship with fishing uh, vessels. Uh, since you, you, you also mentioned in the discussion and, and we had this point on the former paper, um, if you have any information, it's welcome. So um, we don't have any information about it uh, in Italy. Um, I, I just know uh, from talking to fishermen that uh, of course, sometimes they observe them and uh, there is like a, a tuna farm close and when they feed the fish they like uh, they're able to like um, observe uh, storm petrel feeding on the oil and on the slicks but we don't know uh, anything else about their interaction with uh, with fisheries uh, but uh, also i think that's because uh, in italy generally we don't know very much about uh, seabird by catch Correct me, Jacopo, if I'm wrong, but uh, I think uh, we know very little about. Uh, yeah, so that's incredible. So that means if they are attracted to these facilities, you you could even have some sort of experimental setup. Yeah, uh, the thing is, uh, this year I, I tried to persuade the people working there to take me there just to observe uh, observe them and see what uh, we could do. But uh, they, since he's privately owned, they they don't like to have people around. But uh, so, so that's kind of an issue. But surprisingly, or not surprisingly, considering the small sample size, none of the tracked the storm petrels went there. 
So <laughs> I don't know what's the proportion of uh, Storm Petrol exploiting uh, uh, that kind of uh, um, food uh, source, but uh, it's a thing to consider. Also, I think because uh, in Spain, uh, uh, it's been observed uh, more frequently. Yeah, go ahead, Jacob. Yeah, well, actually, I, I was um, going to to comment about about this. I mean, uh, in Spain, they are commonly seen in in these uh, aquaculture structures, and uh, they they commonly fit in these areas. Whether this is a large part of the a large proportion of the population or not, we we don't know, but uh, they are quite common. Not so much in these carts or behind the the vessels, but in these uh, facilities for for tuna. Yeah, to grow and so on, they are quite common. So, and uh, now I just wanted to to join the, the excitement of tracking storm petrels. We are tracking them in several places, actually in Cabo Verde and Canary Islands, in, in Mexico also too. And uh, it's for me, it's kind of the the ultimate frontier for for the tracking studies in in seabirds. There is nothing smaller than that. So, it's just the end of a the end of a um, of a period uh, of, of of discovering more and more uh, about the tracking of, of seabirds and and somehow it's it's the end of an epoch uh, so because because there is nothing new to track beyond this so there's no other challenge we just arrived to the end and uh, that's very very exciting actually to see all these all these new tracks on on these smaller species and uh, so, yeah, I, I am also very excited every time I, I check this, this, uh, these trips. And um, I wanted to comment on another thing, but I forgot about it. So, okay. Uh, <laughs> tracking, tracking bumblebees, says, says Virginia. <laughs> well, the next, at the yeah, biologic the conference, uh, exactly. At yeah. the biologic conference, there was a keynote uh, on uh, on uh, tracking insects, uh, even with accelerometers, actually. So no, nope. yeah, no, no, that's uh, that's, that's quantum level stuff right there. <laughs> All right, we're we're five five minutes past the hour, so I guess we're getting we're getting to the ends here now. But um, yeah, I just want to I want to ask those of you who work in the Mediterranean, and this is this is an important question: How pleasant is the weather? Because for most of us who work in temperate climates and and in the Arctic and the Antarctic, we know that like basically we're always working in garbage weather. And I always have this picture that working in the Mediterranean is always like sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows. Is that the case? I mean, is it always warm? Are you in t-shirts and shorts? Well, not always. Uh, when uh, I remember one field trip in April in Sardinia for sure water and it was freezing, literally freezing. I had uh, all my, my snowboarding uh, technical uh, uh, clothes on and I was freezing. It was uh, raining. Everything was wet. So it's not always that pleasant. <laughs> I really need a more tough PhD student. <laughs> well, my, I'm almost finished. Crazy. So the next <laughs> one, you can find it tougher. <laughs> but Federico, you have been, you have been in the UK. Come on, you have been yeah. trained. Yeah, I know, I know. But uh, still, it was freezing. But generally, yes, it's very, it's very nice. But Come I, on, admit I, it. Admit yeah, but I, after it's, UK, like a, it's like a vacation, right? Hey. <laughs> So, compared to the tropics, it's not that warm. <laughs> I mean, you even got, you, you cannot complain. You cannot no, no, complain. No. <laughs> I, I think so. UK people would have problems with the heat more than the cold. <laughs> like for us, it's very mild and perfect. But for people from the UK north, they yeah. would complain about the heat. So and anything over like 20 degrees Celsius is, is like a limit for me. Oh, right? you would That's... not survive then, my friend. <laughs> I've worked at 35 <laughs> degrees at night. No, 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 none of that. <laughs> none of that stuff for me, no. <laughs> and, All right. And another problem, another oh. problem that you have in Mediterranean that you don't have in Antarctic is that you also have to deal with the good food and good wine, which is <laughs> really <laughs> amazing. <laughs> Let's really let's not get started on the food All situation right. in Antarctica. <laughs> that so was great. We've talking for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so you either come with us with the food, or we come to you, and uh, I mean, we, we need to, to, to do this exchange. <laughs> <laughs>
It's nothing like a good food exchange. I see Fernanda has joined us again and she's walking. I've, I'm impressed every time she's come on. She's like been in various stages of, of, of transportation. So I, I'm impressed. Thank, thanks for joining Fernanda. And Celine is joining us from a train as well. So we're, we're doing pretty good today. It's, it's dedication to the cause right there. Um, all right, I think with that, I, I we just, can- uh, oh. I just uh, remember now what I wanted to say. Sorry, if you have a minute. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't I'm want fine. To spoil the, I don't want to spoil actually the information, but uh, there is a, they, they, there will come out a paper very soon in, in IBIS uh, on, the, on the geolocation of storm petrels in the Mediterranean. And you will have your answer, David, on whether they are living or not the Mediterranean. I'm not going to advance it. So, but uh, it will come out soon. It's a, a paper by Teresa Militao and Raul Ramos and Anna Sant and so on. And hopefully you will see it in, in a few months. Very nice. There, there was one uh, tracking uh, storm petrels uh, with GLS from Malta, right? Uh, a, a, a few years ago. Uh, yes, it is, it is tried and the results are a bit different. And, and, uh, and, and in this paper, they have uh, many more tracks because uh -huh. the Malta paper was very, I just like three or four or something like this. Okay. So different results means that they leave the Mediterranean, right? <laughs> now we want. Now we want to know. Yeah. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna be live, we're gonna be left hanging. It's like cliffhanger. Just to, to be continued with 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 two ellipses at the end. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining Thank us you. for this fantastic session. Um, I'm going to stop recording here now. Before I do, I just want to uh, point out that we're, you know, almost two years into this pandemic at this point. I'm sure a lot of us are struggling with mental health and, and various other issues. And I want you all, I want this to be a message to everyone. Please take care of yourselves. Um, take some time off where you can and, uh, and try and get your heads back into uh, the reasons why we do what we do because obviously it's uh, sometimes it's it's easy to get lost in the forest um so um it was great seeing you all looking forward to seeing you all again um uh, our next session we haven't planned yet but i'm sure we'll we'll be sending out lots of emails and like and we'll uh, we'll be in touch so thank you again and nice to see you i'm going to stop recording now and then you can all breathe a sigh of relief <laughs>